why do something that's not inspiring? Weigh yourself down when you can liberate yourself, free yourself <clears throat> to do what you really love to do and give opportunities to other people to do the same. This is uh, one of the most significant topics of living a self-actualized and inspired life, in fact, that I want to address this. So if you have something to write with, write on or take notes or type or somewhere to gather the information, you might want to do that. First, I want you to, to write this down, that each individual, you, everyone you meet, has a set of priorities, a set of values that they live their life by. And it's fingerprint specific. Their values are unique. Their hierarchy of values are unique. Whenever they are doing something that is truly highest on their list of values, truly most important, truly most meaningful, the thing that spontaneously inspires them that they can't wait to go and do. When they do those and they achieve and fulfill what it is that's most meaningful, their self-worth goes up, their confidence goes up, their belief in themselves goes up, in other words, their self-worth goes up. They automatically expand their space and time horizons. They automatically wake up their natural born leader and they give themselves permission to go and pursue something greater. And the brain, your brain, with its uh, subcortical regions that are filtering mechanisms, filter the reality most effectively, make decisions most efficiently, and take actions that are most effective whenever you are doing something that's highest. Now, as you go down the list of values in an individual, into lower values, because they are less valuable in you, in your mind, less fulfilling, less meaningful, uh, you're less engaged, you're less enthused, less inspired, less present with them. It's like a young boy doing his video games. He loves doing his video games. He can do it all day and forgets time thinking about it, doing it. But if you happen to do his chores, he procrastinates, hesitates, and frustrates. So anytime you're doing lower priority actions, you tend to procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate. And anytime you're doing high priority actions, you tend to be disciplined, reliable, and focused. Now that's significant. And it's so simple, it's ridiculous. We, we, uh, we sometimes overlook the obvious, the elusive obvious, or how important that one statement is. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day is going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. There's a principle in the, in the universe called entropy. It's a thermodynamic law. If you don't bring order to things, disorder ensues and takes over. Just like if you don't invest your money into assets, depreciable consumable liabilities will take it away. That's why the wealthy always pay themselves first and don't wait to see if there's anything left over because unexpected bills come in to destroy it. Now, this principle is universal. You're not going to violate it. It's solid. I'm certain about it. I've been doing it and using it for 40 years now. And uh, if you don't fill your day with high priority actions, it's going to fill up with low priority distractions. If you don't fill your day with high priority challenges, it's going to fill up with low priority challenges, things you don't want. Now, this leads us to the principle of delegation. If you're not filling your day with high priority actions that are meaningful and inspiring and productive and that serve people that you become remunerated for and you end up having an income for that inspires you and doing what you love and getting paid for it and having sustainable fair exchange with people, you won't have the income to delegate the lower priority things and your day will become consumed by low priority actions. And when it's consumed by low priority actions, you depreciate yourself, you devalue yourself, you lose confidence in yourself, you brain load and offload decisions to others and subordinate to the conforming of the outside herd. And you become a follower, not a leader. If you want to be a leader, you have to live by the highest priority. If you want to be a follower, you live by lower priorities. So if you're not delegating lower priority actions, you're not liberating yourself from the things that are weighing you down, that you aren't inspired to do, that distract, 
and that you procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate, you become less efficient, less effective, less profoundly impactful. So delegation is an absolutely essential component in self-actualization. Delegation is an, is an essential aspect of living an inspired life. I fill my day with research, writing, and teaching. Most of it is teaching. My highest priority, my highest value is teaching. And learning is second. So if I'm not learning, I'm, if I'm not teaching, I'm learning. And I'm teaching through every possible vehicle. And when I fill my day with that, and I learn and I do that, and I delegate the rest away, I'm liberated from an uninspired life, and I end up making more income, reaching more people, having more impact, and living more inspired. Delegation is an absolutely essential component. When you delegate, though, you're going to micromanage and get distracted having to manage people if you don't get somebody that you delegate to that has the delegated responsibilities high on their value. So when you're screening people to delegate, if you're not finding out what is their highest values and not finding out how specifically the things you want to delegate, the duties, responsibilities, or challenge, you know, the, the actions that you're going to give them, if, they're, if they can't see how it's helping them fulfill their highest values, they're not going to want to do it. And then you're going to end up having to micromanage them and oversee them and distract yourself from something that's producing more, and it's ineffective. It is essential to find somebody who would love to do more effectively and efficiently than you do the actions that you want to delegate. And it's that simple, not easy to always find. It may take you a few people to find it. But the screening according to values on my website is a value determination process. It's for everybody. It's complimentary. DrDmartini.com, value determine, determine, determine your values on there. Please familiarize yourself with that tool. And when you hire somebody, don't ever hire anybody without going through that tool with them and finding out what they're really committed to and what they value. Because if you hire somebody that's not inspired to do what you want to delegate, you'll end up having to go overseed all the time, distract yourself from what can produce more. And you're down depreciating yourself, micromanaging and frustrating yourself. But find somebody who would absolutely love to do it. When you do, you increase the economy, you increase job opportunities, you increase employment, you increase uh, the exchange of money, the trading and purchasing, and the whole overall economy goes up when you delegate properly. Now, if you're not delegating and you're trapped, you're going to lower your vitality, you're going to lower your self-image. Our self-image and self-worth are proportionate to how liberated we are from low-priority things. It's really that simple. Now, I'd like to give you an example of something that I did that liberated me, that helped my business. And then I'd like to tell you another example, another story that I think will be pertinent because uh, you may be thinking, well, I don't even have a business. How am I going to delegate? I may be at home. Well, I'm going to apply to both of them. When I was 27 years old, I had opened up my practice <clears throat> and I had one assistant at the time. I just opened up in October. And here it is around November. So it's six weeks or so in, I guess. It's a couple weeks before my birthday at, eight, at 28. And I uh, realized that I was doing everything in my practice. I mean, from picking up trash to doing supplies to everything, administrative work, everything else. And I thought, wow, I went to 10 years of college almost for this. This is not what I'm inspired by. I want to do the clinical work. I want to work with patients and things. And I was bogged down in things, actions. So I went to a Walden's bookstore, which is a chain store at the time. Dalton's and Walden's were the bookstores at the time. It's before Borders came about and before Amazon came about. And I was led to a book called The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie. It's still out there, still a great book. It's been updated. I like the original one more than the one that's here now, but it's still, it's a great book. And as I read through that and circled and underlined and became familiar with the book and extracted from it, I realized that I was in my way. And I was going to limit my growth if I didn't delegate. I had to delegate. And I realized that the reasons why I wasn't delegating is because, well, I thought, well, by the time I could have delegated and explained it to them, I could have done. Uh, well, the way I do it is better than they do it, and they're not going to do it the way I want, so I'm going to be frustrated. Or, you know, might as well just get it done. I need to know how to do it anyway. And, da, da, da. and I came up with all my reasons and excuses for doing it. So I was trapped doing a 20, 10 to $20 an hour job back then which probably be worth around 40 or 50 now, but 
a $10 to $20 an hour job back then when I was capable of earning thousand, two thousand dollars an hour more if I was doing what I really was skilled for. And I realized that I was devaluing myself and diluting my business because I was diluting what I was doing per hour. And so I, I got this book, I summarized it, and I did a, create a chart. And you might want to get the piece of paper out and draw this chart. It's a very significant chart. I put a, a piece of paper together and I put five lines equally dispersed on it to where I had six equal space columns. In the first column, I wrote down what I was doing in a day. And I wrote down every single thing that I did in a day at home and at work from the time I got up to the time I went to bed over about a three month period because certain, certain days of the week I did certain things differently than others. So I wanna include every single thing that I did and I wrote everything action I did. I didn't write down sales, marketing, too broad, too general. I wrote down specific actions. Write down every single action you do in a day. Nitpicky actions you might do in a day. Answer the telephone, write an email, whatever it may be. Every single action you do, managing things, uh, checking up on things and looking on the internet, whatever you might do, write down what you do. And there's take a day and take and literally take a, a drone, look over it, video it, and look at it objectively. And what do you do in a day? After you've made that list, you're going to be humbled because you're going to realize you're emphasizing and putting energy into something that's not really most important. You're majoring in minors and mining your majors in all probability. In fact, everybody I've ever done this with, I found this. In the second column, you write down what is it produced per hour? How much income does that action generate because if you're doing something that serves people you're generating an income you're in fair exchange with them and if they value it and you're filling their needs they're going to pay for it and if you're not well then you're not doing anything that fills anybody needs what, what there's no service there's no fulfillment in life unless you're serving somebody not just yourself narcissism and just self-absorption doesn't get you fulfillment and altruism and sacrificing yourself doesn't do it but having a fair sustainable exchange does so how much is it producing per hour well, I went down this list and, you know, whatever I was doing from exams to blood work, to your analysis, to, uh, you know, everything I was doing, I was extrapolating it based on per hour. So if I spent 20 minutes on it, I multiplied times three. If I spent 10 minutes, I multiplied times six. If I spent two hours on it, divided by half. And when I did that, I realized that the, my hour was being consumed by quite a variable amount of income generators. And then I found out that a good 20 to 30% of what I was doing was zero. That means I was just doing something. I wasn't producing anything, not serving anybody, not getting income, et cetera. And I noticed that when I was doing it, it was uninspiring to me. I felt bogged down and frustrated by it and devalued, which is understandable. So I made a list of what it produced per hour. And that was an eye opener, a major eye opener. Because then I realized, okay, now from this, and, and by the way, when I did this, I found out that even though I went to almost 10 years to college to be a specialist in, in spinal concerns at the time, I realized that my actual pr most productive thing I could do was going out and speaking and sharing uh, the message of what I might be able to do for people. So out there actually uh, speaking to audiences produced the most patience, which generated the most income per hour, which was astonishing. And I realized that if I'm sitting there in my cubicle, I'm actually undermining my potential growth. And that was a shock to me to find that out. In the third column, I wrote down how much meaning does it have on a one to 10 scale? And the thing at the top 10 meant that it was very inspiring. And I couldn't wait to get up and do it. And a one or zero down there was something I did as drudgery. I didn't want to do it. I had to do it, got to do it. I was by duty instead of design. So I basically um, wrote it down on one to 10 scale. And then I noticed that some of the ones that were most productive and producing the most income and the ones that were most inspiring happened to match, luckily. And then some of the ones didn't, but most of them did, which that gave me encouragement because if I can do the thing that's most meaningful and I can do the thing that's most productive, I can't wait to get up in the morning and do it. And now the next column was, how much would it cost me to delegate that to somebody and find a specialist to do it to the same quality and quantity that I can do it? And that meant everything, not just salaries, but the use of space, uh, the training, the insurance, the parking, the equipment, the computer, the telephone, every single cost. I want to know what the cost of somebody to do that, to get the same job done, et cetera. And then when I put those down, that took me a bit of time because I had to think it through. 
I then looked at where the biggest spreads were between what produced per hour versus what it cost per hour if I delegated. So I could extract labor value out of an individual and allow them to have a job and me to have a more profit. And I was able to do what was most meaningful to me, that I was less likely to be able to delegate. And then the next column, I wrote down how much time did I spend <clears throat> on each of these actions, the actual amount of minutes I did per day. And the very last column is the final prioritization. And on that final prioritization, I put that in layers. I took the ones that were most productive, the most meaningful and productive things, I put them at the top. And whenever where there was a big gap between production and meaning and something else, I separate them into layers. Because <clears throat> I wanted to, I knew that if I was out there with a man, with a, I was a man on a mission with a message, sharing that message was the most productive thing I could be doing on radio and television and talking and speaking and leveraging myself. And the second most important thing was me actually clinically being in there with clients. And then I went down that list and doing paperwork and changing uh, supplies and doing cleaning, uh, cleaning play. That's way at the bottom. So what I did is I put it in layers based on productivity and meaning and based on how much spread there was. And then I layered it into layers and I hired somebody to do the lowest delegated layer and then the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And over an 18 month period, I went from a single office with myself and one assistant to five doctors and 12 staff members with a 5,000 square foot office instead of a less than a thousand square foot office and my income tenfolded. Now that was significant because I realized that unless I delegated, I was in my way. So delegation is crucial. So I'm trying to make a point that if you're not filling your day with the highest priority, most meaningful, most productive, most inspiring, most impactful actions, you have no one but to look at in the mirror except yourself of why you're not fulfilled and inspired and productive and profitable and, and prosperous. It's that simple. If you really care about people and yourself, you're going to want to fulfill their highest values. You're going to fulfill yours. Fulfilling yours is the one that means meaning and the fulfilling theirs is the one that's productive. And if you do that, anytime you do that, you're rewarded and you automatically can scale that. If you delegate, you can't scale without delegation. You're trapped. That's why they call it the time trap. Now I was in Washington and I was teaching the breakthrough experience program. And by the way, if you don't fill your day with high priority actions, it fills up with low priority distractions, but the same for the week, the month, the year, a, a decade, a generation and a life. That's one of the reasons I teach uh, my program, Master Planning for Life. Master Planning for Life is about taking command of how you want your life in a way you can structure it, you can liberate yourself and, and increase your productivity and your profitability and your, your fulfillment at a level. That's the whole reason I put that together. Once I realized that, I just became relentless in the pursuit of that. And I did it in all areas of my life, not just my business, but in every area. Prioritizing what I read, prioritizing who I hung out with, prioritizing where I went prioritizing the places that I surround myself, prioritizing where I viewed, you know, everything got prioritized because I realized that that's a principle of life. If you're not living by priority, it's automatically going to be dis disempowering. So I'm in Washington, I'm doing the breakthrough experience, which is my signature program, which I've done 1,117 times coming up. And uh, what's interesting is there's a lovely lady there who spoke up and she said, well, I am, at home, I'm a stay-at-home mom now. I was a doctor, but when my third child came, I decided to stay home. And she says, I'm frustrated because my husband's not helping around the house and I'm feeling trapped. And I said to her, I said, okay, you were in practice. When you're in practice, what kind of money could you generate per hour? And she said, well, it really wasn't too much, maybe 600 to $800 now. Okay. And, and right now, you're doing all kinds of things. Let's list what you're doing at home. And she was cleaning. And, and, and because she had read a bunch of what I call tofu mama um, uh, books on how to raise children, she was cleaning natural cotton diapers. She's making organic purees. She was doing it all. And I, and I said, well, she's doing what she believes is best for the child. But what she was doing is taking a six to $800 an hour per person and putting them down into a 10 to $15 an hour job, maybe $20 an hour job. And so I made a list of everything she was doing in a day. And I had her go through this process. How much is it producing per hour, which was zero? How much is it, uh, uh, how much meaning was it? And some of them were meaningful and some of them were not. They were meaningful to her kids, but not her. And that's a big factor. 
She thought, because what she was doing is she was subordinating to the outer authority of a lady who wrote a book who never had a doctorate degree and probably couldn't make more than $25 an hour at the time. And she, they were writing the book. She thought, oh, they're the expert. I got to follow their footsteps. But if you follow the values of other people, you'll automatically self-depreciate yourself. So what we did is we made a list of everything she was doing and she was cleaning and she was cooking and she was going to the grocery store and she was spending time with the kids and she was educating them. And we prioritized those. We found out how much they actually produced, zero. We found out how much it would cost to get that delegated. And then we realized that if she worked eight hours a week, two hours a day, four days a week, eight hours to keep her life based on her education and keep her in the game and keep her from losing her faculties in that area. She could, if she made 600 even, or 700, let's say 700 times eight, $5,600 a week. If she did that, it's 20 something thousand dollars a year. She could pay somebody 2,500 to $3,000 a month to take care of the cleaning, the, uh, the, the driving around, the grocery shopping, the management of, of, of uh, food substances and everything else. And anyway, when she did, she was not bitching at her husband when she finally got that. We, we ended up structuring that. We got her that. She started working. She had somebody to do that. Instead of expecting her husband to do it, he didn't want to do it. And he had to work more because she wasn't working. And he didn't want to do that because that's devaluing him. And he was making $1,200 to $1,500 an hour. So what the heck? She, he was now liberated. She was now liberated. You know, the lower the socioeconomic, the more you pass your lifestyle onto your kids and they just duplicate Low socioeconomic uh, poor people just typically follow in the footsteps as a trade. They're trade trained and they become an apprentice under a trade. But people, they go up the socioeconomics because they've delegated, because they've risen, end up with specialties and get more advanced uh, income from it and serve more vast numbers with scale. And so the question is, is where do you want to play in the game of life? Delegation liberates you from the bondage of weighing yourself down, doing things that are uninspiring, living by duty, living by what you think you should do, ought to do, everything else, because you haven't given yourself permission to go and do something that's deeply meaningful and traps you. Now, this lady made more income, put away college education funds, had more time for vacation with the kids, had higher quality tutoring for the kids, had more opportunity to go to museums and places and things that were with the kids. And she came home and the house was clean and the things were, were prepared and and uh, the clothes were cleaned and the purees were done and everything else. And she didn't have to go stand in a grocery store line, which is ineffective, even though today you've got to, you can order it online, but still she changed her life because she prioritized her life and she delegated. I cannot tell you how important delegation is. You're, you're, you're not going to live an absolutely inspired life. Every minute you do something that isn't inspiring. And nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate their life to your fulfillment. Nobody's going to dedicate that, that uh, delegations and structure if you're not uh, pursuing what's really most important. So you want to ask yourself, what is the highest priority action I can do today to serve the greatest number of people in the most efficient, effective way that allows me to be inspired and to help inspire other people? If you do that, you're going to move in a direction of an inspired life. You're going to end up delegating your way into liberty. And I mean liberty. Now, if you don't hire somebody that's inspired and you hire Z people, not A quality people, you're going to end up micromanaging and distracting yourself and being effective. And so delegation doesn't cost if it's done properly. It costs if it's not. So don't just hire anybody. Make sure you go to the value determination process on our website. Make sure you go and find out <clears throat> who you're going to delegate to if they really love doing that. If they have no history of doing what you're wanting to do and it's not their dream, they're probably not going to be engaged in doing it. <clears throat> and you're going to have to probably, you know, micromanage them and push them uphill and remind them. Anytime you have to remind or motivate or extrinsically push somebody to do something, it's not intrinsically inspiring to them. It's not meaningful to them. It's not important to them. Don't waste your time hiring people that don't have that, that, uh, that drive. Or you're going to end up just frustrating yourself and it's going to cost you, not make you, because you're not delegating, you're micromanaging thinking it's delegation. Hiring somebody and micromanaging and trapping yourself is not delegation. It is delegation is, is disseminating authority onto other people who are able and capable of doing what you want done more effective than you. And so you can get on with doing what you love doing or what you're effective at. That way you become great at what you do. They become great at what they do and your specialties help. Ricardo's law of efficiency says anytime you can get people to do their specialties, it helps the expedite. 
My specialty is researching and teaching. If I'm able to do that, I do the most with my business and my life and have the most fulfillment. But if I sit and get micromanaged or go down and doing some, some things that's not inspiring to me, down I go. So the key is to make sure that you identify what's really valuable to you. It goes back to the where I started. Your hierarchy of values dictates your destiny. If you live by your highest values, your destiny is going to expand. If you live by lower values, your destiny is going to shrink. I think that's why they called psychologists shrinks. Because most people who are uninspired and don't know that and don't live wisely, they automatically end up at the shrink. Because they're now, and, and by the way, when you're living by your highest value, your blood glucose and oxygen goes into your forebrain where you get creative vision, inspired vision, creative uh, strategic thinking, planning, foresight, uh, desire to execute, and self-governance. You're more calm. You're more centered. You're less impulsive, less instinctual, less animal-like, less habitual. You're more creative, and you're more innovative. And this is where you're great. This is where you have the greatest genius. But if you don't live by highest value, your blood glucose and oxygen goes into your hindbrain, or, or at least your amygdala down below. And this is where you're into avoid pain, seek pleasure. And this is people that want to avoid pain and seek pleasure only to want to do things if it's pleasurable and it's not, they want to give up. And they go and take uh, coffee and tea and sweets and, and porn and, and internet distractions and anything that distracts them from their unengaged life because they're not doing what they love. So don't surround yourself with people that are disengaged or you'll end up disengaged yourself. You'll have to go down and micromanage. Find somebody that would love to do what you want to delegate, liberate yourself, and you'll be more efficient. They will make you money. You will make you money. They will make themselves money. The people will end up getting more advancement, and you will exemplify what's possible for other people, which draws and magnetizes opportunity and people, places, things, ideas, and events that your innermost dominant thought creates in your mind. How Thoughts Become Things is a new movie that you may want to go check out that I had the opportunity to be in about how what your innermost dominant thought does become your outermost tangible reality. Your innermost dominant thought is an expression of your highest value. If you're not able to focus on your highest value because you're micromanaging and distracting and doing low priority stuff, your greatness and your creativity and the life that you dream about is not as easily manifested. So I just want to spend a few moments with you on the significance of delegation because uh, I know in my own life, uh, they call me Mrs. Mr. Delegator. <laughs> I, I was doing a podcast a few days ago uh, with a lovely lady and uh, here in Houston, amazing uh, lady that uh, has a, uh, a podcast called CEO Blindspot. And it's for CEOs and entrepreneurs. And we were discussing delegation. And I was jokingly saying that I delegate just about everything in my life. I've delegated everything. I, 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 I don't wipe my butt with it, but I, but I joke about that. And I don't really uh, delegate lovemaking to other people, but I joke about it. And I was telling him on the, on the show that, that if you, uh, you know, when, when uh, my girlfriend wants uh, lovemaking, if I tell her, if I delegate it to, to Hugh Jackman or Brad Pitt to take care of the lovemaking, would you still love me? And she said, absolutely. Because if I can give her more value, <laughs> more efficiently, she'll appreciate that. And I'm joking, of course. But the point is that why do something that's not inspiring, weigh yourself down, when you can liberate yourself, free yourself <clears throat> to do what you really love to do and give opportunities to other people to do the same and help the economy, help the lives, help inspire. And I really believe that we are rewarded to the degree that we help ourselves and others <clears throat> live by the highest values. I believe our rewards in life and our fulfillment in life is going to be correlated with that. So anything you can do to delegate is to your advantage. So I want to take a moment to talk about delegation. I think I've, I've shared most of it now. And uh, so thank you for, for, uh, for just contemplating the significance of what it can do for your life. And it may not be an easy thing. And when I first started doing it, I had a few pitfalls along the way, but I, I just kept, I read that book. I learned it. I followed that process. I kept doing it again. I did it every quarter and I looked at where I was now and I looked at what else I could delegate. And today I research, write and teach. And I don't have to do the rest of the stuff. I haven't done uh, checked on bills. I haven't driven a car. I haven't uh, done administrative stuff. I haven't cooked. You know, I don't do anything other than what I'm most inspired to do. The rest of it is delegated away. And that is very liberating. And you're very grateful. And you have way more to be grateful for in your life if you do that every day. I count my blessings and I'm grateful. I got the largest list of gratitude of any human being I've met. And I document it every day. And it's because of that process called delegation. Now, 
you're going to delegate further because the second you live by your lower values, you're going to shrink your vision. And whenever you live by your highest values, you're going to expand your vision. I'd like to say something. I'd like to give you a gift. And this gift is something called uh, awakening your astronomical vision. Now, what this is, is what we're talking about. It's about delegating lower priority things, getting on to higher priority things, expanding your vision. Because if you don't have an astronomical vision, don't expect to make a global difference. You are not going to grow, outgrow your vision. And if your vision is bigger, so is your life. And so is the cause. And so is the effect in your life and the impact on your life. So take advantage of this little gift. It's a $50 gift, awaking your astronomical vision. It's a live presentation I did at a planetarium, metaphorically. We did it to a group of CEOs and executives that had big businesses. And we share with them how to take and scale their lives up to the next level. And this is including their personal life and professional life. And I'm absolutely certain if you listen to this more than once, and most people do five or six times, it's going to give you a gift. It's going to give you an advantage and you're going to take notes and it's going to be helpful. It's practical. It's inspirational. It's mind expanding. It's going to give you a bigger vision and you may not have to be trapped doing low priority things. And I know this will help you. So take advantage of this gift. I want you to have that. I want you to use it. Listen to it. Promise you'll listen to it because I know you'll say thank you by listening to it more than once. It's, it's filled with gems. You'll take notes. It will be something you can implement right away. It's useful. And if you feel you got something out of this little, this little presentation and you know somebody, in fact, probably in the, while you're sitting here, you're thinking, God, I wish so-and-so could have listened to this. If you know somebody that you wish had been able to hear this, help them hear it. Spread the word. Get on your database. Let people know what we're doing. Because every week we give some educational piece like this. And if you got a value out of it, share it with the people you do. If you help other people get what they want to get in life, it helps you get what you want to get in life. It helps you build your network because then they spread it to the next network. And we all grow. Thank you for joining me for this presentation today. If you found value out of the presentation, please go below and please share your comments. We certainly appreciate that feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification icons. That way I can bring more content to you and share more to help you maximize your life. I look forward to our next presentation. Thank you so much for joining me.